Good morning, everyone. I am Victoria Alonso Perez, and I will be the moderator for today. I have been inspired by astronauts since I was very little. When I was four years old, my dad, who is an accountant, was writing numbers on a big piece of paper, and I asked him what was the use of those numbers. And um, so that was a full moon day, and he took me to the window, and he asked me how many numbers I knew. I told him that only the ones that I could count with the fingers of my hands. And uh, he showed me the moon, and he told me that humans had been there thanks to the proper combination of those numbers. I was so impressed that I have been passionate about space ever since. And when I was a kid, I would many times get asked, do you want to be an astronaut? And I was always very afraid. So I would say, oh, well, I would hide my fear by saying, well, even if I would want to be an astronaut, I couldn't because Uruguay has no space program. So I couldn't be an astronaut. Nowadays, with commercial uh, space missions, everyone from any nationality can, be, can go to space. It is still very expensive, so it's not really accessible for everyone, but at least the possibility exists. Still, uh, given that the last time that I rode uh, Space Mountain on Disney World, I got super sick, I don't think I would be the best astronaut candidate. <laughs> but it is great to know that young girls in Uruguay can have the possibility to go to space. And today we have an out of this world panel uh, and with great uh, speakers, let me introduce you to Dr. Deva Newman, Director of MIT Media Lab and former NASA Deputy Administrator and professor, Apollo Professor of Astronautics. Uh, Mr. Dylan Taylor, Founder and CEO of Voyager Space, Founder of Space for Humanity and a Blue Origin astronaut. And Mr. Ethan Steven, crew member of the AX-1 mission, the first commercial mission to the ISA, to the International Space Station, and the second Israeli astronaut. After the first, Ilan Ramon, together with six crew members, did not survive the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster 21 years ago. So let me start with you, Ethan. Um, what is the purpose of astronauts? Thank you, Victoria. So my answer to what is the purpose of astronaut is another question. What is the purpose of a human being? The answers are deeply connected. Curiosity is at the core of what it means to be human. Our passion to explore, to discover, to learn are part of our nature, especially when it comes to mysteries of our planet and the universe that lies beyond it. The purpose, the role of an astronaut is constantly evolving from a role that was defined by competition during the Cold War through international cooperation creating the ISS. Today, the third phase of space exploration is privatization. My mission, AX-1, was the first private commercial mission to the ISS in 2022. NASA, ESA, and private astronauts all work together, sharing the scarce resources of oxygen, water, food, energy, and lab availability. And maybe most importantly, we shared perspectives in our amazement at what we were experiencing. My mission, a private mission, required to create in just 16 months our own private space agency, Rakia, in partnership with the private sector and government agencies. Our motto was space for all. To meet that goal, we open sourced the mission, inviting proposal from scientists, artists, educators, students, children, and leaders on a range of disciplines. Their ideas were incredible, super incredible. One inspired us to run experiments on the ISS with CRISPR-based genetic diagnostics. Another led us to create optical lenses from liquid polymers in space manufacturing that could be used to build everything from medical devices to extremely large space telescopes. We engaged artists, philosophers, and poets, inspired by the Portuguese poet Camões, who described the essence of the travels of the great 15th century explorer Vasco da Gama. And in collaboration with atmospheric researchers, we studied electrical discharge phenomena in the upper atmosphere called TLEs. This strategy has helped broaden the way millions of people experience what, possibly, what is possible in space and how it can impact us here on Earth. Our impact report, report of a space mission, 
describes how the mission made 95 distinct contributions across 10 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, from quality education, good health, climate action, industry, and innovation. I will take this opportunity, as AI was a topic here at the forum, to suggest that I'm not worried about astronauts being replaced by AI. AI will do many things to advance space exploration, but it will never have the curiosity and the critical thinking skills to complete these complex missions. As MIT professor, your colleague and NASA astronaut Jeff Hoffman told me last year, he wished he had an astronaut on Mars to troubleshoot his rover and Moxie oxygen mm -hmm. experiment. So AI is a new wonder, but as Sophocles said, 2,400 years ago. Numberless are the world's wonders, but none more wonderful than the human being. Indeed, our humanity, not just our technology, is what will carry us back to the moon, then on to Mars. At the same time, I hope it will also heighten our sense of responsibility about the scarce resources on our spaceship Earth. All of us who travel to space can bring this message home <coughs> which is one more reason that space must not remain the preserve of the few. It should be made accessible to all as a realm of discovery and human creativity. And until that moment, astronauts are committed to bring the wonders of space to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, great description of why we actually need human presence in space. Um, Deva, the MIT Media Lab Astronaut Ethnography Project interviews astronauts and analyzes data about their life in space and at the International Space Station. What are some of the key lessons that you learned through all that? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for the panel, joining colleagues. So, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let's see. I want to uh, actually go back, uh, way back. Uh, to the, the 1990s when we got started um, interviewing. I've flown five experiments. Um, up, I started uh, actually the space shuttle, remember the space shuttle days, two, two week missions. We would go 24 seven, we would train the astronauts because we had only two weeks to get all the physiological data we could because we're getting ready, you know, going back to the moon and Mars. And then working very, very closely with the Russians on the Mir, Mir in Russian means peace. So the peace space station. And um, we started actually interviewing, astronauts are always interviewed pre-flight and post-flight, but when we had our NASA astronauts spend long duration mm -hmm. up after our Skylab missions, then on Mir, together with the Russians, we said, this is really important to document. We have to get all those lessons learned. Two major programs going about it very differently. What can we learn for the future? The future of the International Space Station. When we have five main international partners, and now we have over 100 nations working together flying experiments. So the ethnography in terms of each person's individual experience and was really important. You might not know, so a little bit quick background, you, use a lot, you lose a lot of muscle and bone when you go into space. You're floating around. So one to two percent bone mineral density loss per month. Now who wants to go on my four-year Mars mission? <laughs> and this is with two hours a day of exercise. Maybe 30 to 40 percent muscle loss. <clears throat> And most importantly, what about their mental well-being? How are they doing as a team? Are we the four people who can function? Because Mir, working with Russians, gave us that two months, three months mission. So we, long duration mission. Two weeks, we can all put up with each other. But when you're months in space, and now we're six months at a time, and now we're performing our one year mission up on space station. So everything changes. Mm -hmm. Takes about a month, I think, for your physiology to really so that's what we were studying, the physiology, and then the questioning of ethnography. And that's mostly about teamwork and leadership. And how do you function? How do you be the most excellent crew you can be every day? And all astronauts will tell you, connections back to home, connections back to loved ones and friends. So we study all space programs. There's big questions. Um, if you lose your country, if your country literally, which happened, if your country changes while you're in space, do you tell your astronauts from ground control? We do at NASA, and, um, we, and back then in the day, uh, the Russians didn't. If someone dies in your family, do you inform the astronauts? It's very, very traumatic. So these are all the human elements. 
Zaytan, it's, it's really about the human, the human experience. How can the humans thrive in isolated, confined environments, living, floating? You know, there's nothing more beautiful than this beautiful view. And all astronauts are transformed. We call it the overview effect. When you see Earth, as in the background here, you get it. We are all astronauts. We're orbiting our sun. And we have to figure out how we can all work together, celebrate all of our similarities and our hope for humanity and you know, spaceship Earth, rather than being divided of our differences. So in some, it's all about the human element. It's all about humans, how humans can thrive and how we can train and have humans thrive when they're in very isolated, confined environments. So since we've all been through the pandemic, as I said, you all have your astronaut wings now. I love how you say it's about the human elements, because if you want to go to Mars or even beyond, that's going to be a really big, important subject. Um, Dylan, how do you believe the commercial expansion of access to space and initiatives like the Citizen Astronaut Program contributed contribute to the broader purpose of astronauts and space exploration? Oh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think space flight is uniquely transformational, and I experienced it myself and at 10 as well. It seems to be a universal effect, this overview effect Dave uh, mentioned. It's probably uh, the most profound experience a human can have, I think. Uh, it really does change you, it really does transform you. And so I believe that space is a tool for transformation. And here at the WEF, I, this is now my 12th uh, Davos, we talk about a lot of these uh, issues uh, year in and year out, uh, whether it's climate or income inequality or um, mass migration. Um, and we seem to be talking past each other quite a bit, right? So these problems seem intractable, but it's perhaps because we don't have the right perspective. So imagine uh, having a uh, space station like the ISS optimized with a conference table and convening a UN Security Council meeting, for, for example, or a G20 meeting, or a meeting between India and Pakistan, or you name whatever rivalry you might have. I think you would have a different outcome. So if you believe that, which I strongly believe, then it's all about how do you, uh, how do you scale space? It doesn't scale particularly well. It's very expensive. Uh, so the idea with the Citizen Astronaut Program, which is attached to Space for Humanity, is could we do a, essentially a fellowship where we pay to send people to space? Uh, I think we got 60,000 applications first time around. But in exchange, uh, once that astronaut comes back, they have to do something to benefit life here on Earth. And it has to be tied to a UN sustainable development goal, and it has to be measurable and tangible. So for example, we sent uh, the first Mexican-born female to space, Katya. Uh, she's now a celebrity in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, she meets with the president of Mexico regularly. They're working on a STEM research center in Mexico for young women uh, in Mexico to inspire the next generation. Uh, we sent the first African-born female to space, an Egyptian national, uh, Sarah Sabri. Uh, she's actually working on democratizing access to space for scientific purposes as well. Uh, and then we sent uh, a mother-daughter duo from the Caribbean, um, and they're, they're now working out exactly what they're going to do uh, to benefit life here on Earth. So to me, it's you go to space to benefit Earth. Space is a tool for transformation, but we need more ambassadors out there talking about this effect. And the ability that, um, you know, when you're up there, it's been said before, but we all live in the same house, literally and figuratively. There is no other place. There is no other people. There's us and um, this miracle. When you're up there, you understand the rest of the universe is cold and hostile and dead, so far as we know. And uh, what we have here is an absolute miracle, and we need to uh, treat it as such, and we need to treat each other better. And when you're up there, it, it becomes so clear to you. Uh, I love this idea of uh, astronauts as a source of inspiration for people here on Earth and to do good. Um, Deva, what do you think is missing or could be enhanced in the human space exploration journey? Is it lack of funding? Do we need more technological developments? A matter of regulations? Well, um, so I want to um, you know, tie on what, what Dylan says. So I want to take everyone, and I mean everyone, 8 billion people to space, uh, transformatively, figuratively. Of course, uh, you know, the launch is expensive, getting out of the gravity well. So we've developed um, virtual reality experiences and tools. Uh, we have a lunar mission coming up this year. 
uh, one of the commercial missions. When I was at, at NASA, we put, in to get, we put in place the public-private partnerships, which allowed for commercial space missions. We redefined the definition of an astronaut, because an astronaut was only an astronaut if you worked for a government agency, a NASA astronaut, European Space Agency astronaut, JAXA astronaut. We redefined that because we knew the commercial access was coming. So it really opened it up. But back to space for all, you know, my vision is that we give all the tools, we give the experience, how can we do that? We can do a lot of that through virtual reality. So we literally have, you know, Earth mission control, a lunar mission control. These are tools for our kids because when we launch this year to the moon, our little rover, my camera that's gonna take pictures on Shackleton Crater. We need that before we can send humans. And, but we, why not? Why can't we take every, every one of you, but also a bit about our kids? To me, it's about the next generation. So they can be lunar explorers. They can help us with the citizen science. They can analyze the data. I wanna open it up. It's accessible and transformative. And when you put yourself, I like augmented reality better than VR. When you put yourself in the augmented reality, and spin around, and 360, you're either on the moon or Mars. Back to Eitan's comment about Jeff Hoffman, our MIT experiment, literally on Mars today, is called MOXIE, Mars Oxygen Institute Research Experiment. What does that mean? We're living off the land. We're taking the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars, it's 1% carbon dioxide, we split off the carbon atoms, we recombine elemental oxygen, Voila, we've made oxygen literally out of the air of Mars. We can only make six grams or so. <laughs> so you might think it's for the astronauts to breathe. Nope, that's number two. The first reason is for fuel. So we're planning for the human mission to Mars. Why are we going to Mars? Well, first, how many of you saw The Martian? Okay, the vast majority, right. Well, it was amazing to be at NASA. Open that up, Ridley Scott did a great movie, and it was a great book. It won't be all potatoes. They got three things wrong technically, but it was a great movie. So back to that, we have to, exploration succeeds when we actually live off the land. So we're making that oxygen as a technology demonstration, first time ever on another planet, it's for fuel. Because when we send humans on a round trip, it's a round trip mission, no one way tickets, that's not ethical. Round trip, you wanna come back to see your family and your friends, and wouldn't that be great if we have our fuel depots there waiting for us? So that's why we're doing the technology. We're doing you know, the advanced planning. And the thing about Mars, why Mars, it's our sister planet, the evidence is mounting. We'll probably find the past evidence of life. Earth and Mars, 4.5 billion years old each. Life worked out pretty well for us here. What about Mars? It, could, it was wet, it was wonderful. It lost its electromagnetism, we call that, lost its dynamo. You don't wanna lose your dynamo. Uh, 3.5 billion years ago, then that's when the sun's solar wind, solar radiation started obliterating Mars' atmosphere. So today it's left with that 1% CO2. So it's a very hostile environment. But 3.5 billion years ago, it had all the conditions, all the chemistry, hydrogen, you know, oxygen, uh, sulfur, methane is coming out of the ground. So it had all the chemistry, all the building blocks that life could have existed. Wow, amazing technology. I wanna try it. I wanna, I wanna try that VR. Yeah. Um, Ethan, you spent 17 days on the International Space Station. Um, could you tell us a bit more um, to us, uh, give us a bit of a, a window into your adventures and what experience in space has most in, impacted you personally? So as a kid, you reminded me just now that I would sleep like Superman, I would go to sleep like that. <laughs> I, I dreamed about uh, floating and free of gravity. And, and then I promised my grandkids, I have five, uh, that I would float into the space station like Superman, and I did. <laughs> but the sensation is amazing. And the first thing you go is uh, you don't look at anything. You go straight to the window, to the cupola, and watch Earth. Um, go, orbiting at 17 over 17,000 miles per hour, you have every 45 minutes or sunset or sunrise. And, uh, and I would, um, because I did, a, if I followed an experiments on about lightning and thunderstorms, I would be alone in the dark in the cupola watching thunderstorms and taking uh, videos of them. And there I saw amazing, amazing uh, views of the atmosphere in different colors, red, blue, uh, yellow, brown, green. 
Um, and obviously I saw three big events of Aurora, the South Pole. <clears throat> and those things uh, you cannot see from anywhere else because you see the whole spread of two, 3,000 kilometers wide of uh, amazing views. Wow, definitely want to go to space now that I hear you. Um, Dylan, Voyager Space is developing the Starlab program, which aims to create a new commercial destination in space. What are the aims and potential contributions of space destinations? Mm. Yeah, so back to what I said earlier, if you believe space is the next big thing for humanity, that it's a tool for transformation, that our civilization can be bettered by um, venturing into space, then it's all about how do we, how do we effectuate that. And what we're uh, missing is this infrastructure layer. Uh, call it a lily pad to go deeper uh, with human spaceflight into space. And uh, the International Space Station is probably one of the best things humans have ever done. Uh, it deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, in my view. Uh, but it's aging. Um, it was never, never really designed, uh, it was sort of assembled as a hodgepodge over time. It wasn't optimized uh, for the uses it has today. ISS will probably come down around 2030, uh, thereabouts, if it lasts that long. It springs a leak from time to time. Some of the systems, uh, the carbon scrub scrubbers and others are, are aging as well. Uh, requires a lot of maintenance and repair to keep it up and running. So the next generation would be these commercial ventures. Why commercial? Well, as we saw with um, rocket launch, we went from the space shuttle to now uh, relanding rocket boosters and launching to space reliably and inexpensively about every three days, which is really a miracle. And the idea is that we would have the same level of innovation uh, with destinations in low Earth orbit as well. So Starlab is one venture that has a, a contract with NASA. There are others. Um, I think there'll be multiple space stations by the end of the 2020s. Uh, but the benefit is, as Etchen said earlier, there's a lot of activities we can do in space that benefit life here on Earth. And so we can optimize these stations for particular purposes. So for example, Starlab is optimized around research. Whether it's microgravity research for biopharma and drug development, uh, you can grow essentially perfect crystals in space. Um, Jim Bridenstine, former NASA administrator, said recently to me uh, that he had been told that there hasn't been a single experiment run on the ISS where humanity hasn't learned something. So it really is a magic laboratory, if you will. So it'll be optimized for research. Other stations might be optimized for tourism or human venture. Others might be optimized for space manufacturing. But the idea would be we build this infrastructure layer in LEO. That enables us uh, more uh, practically to go to the moon, uh, to stay, and build infrastructure on the moon. And then from there, of course, we can go further afield. Um, you know, it, it, Mars is challenging, right? Uh, uh, low Earth orbit, the ISS is at 400 kilometers. The moon's at about 400,000 kilometers. Uh, Mars is in excess of 40 million kilometers. So degree of difficulty is uh, spectacularly hard. And as Davis said, you're probably living in a lava tube underneath uh, the surface of Mars because the radiation is, is uh, severe. Um, so if you want to lose bone mass on the way there for eight months and live in a tunnel, Mars is your place. But um, <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> but if you want to be able to go to space, stay for a couple months and come back, I think low Earth orbit is, is the place to, to focus. And um, so I think we'll have a renaissance on this. I think by the end of the 2020s, two or three of these ventures will be practical. They'll be in orbit. Maybe we can have this uh, symposium uh, in space next time at the end of the 2020s. Yeah. Let me I, comment on yes. the radiation issue, which is a very powerful, damaging uh, force. Um, it damages equipment electronics, and obviously the human body. So there are many, many experiments, with, part of them we did, of vests that protect the human body and special uh, equipment that can respond, fast respond, to protect electronic uh, uh, chips and devices. And that will uh, obviously en enable long missions to Mars and uh, deep space, and obviously it will help us here in, on Earth to protect against uh, damaging radiation. Yeah. I might um, just add on that. Think about human spaceflight. Uh, so radiation is our number one showstopper, you know, could end the mission if we're talking about deep space. So that's Mars for sure. 
even on the moon. That's why, again, going to the moon, learning about this, and it's protecting uh, the astronauts. But we're also doing some unbelievable research in terms of the genetics and the biology of it as well. So I think it might be a combination. We just invented some new materials, some hydrogenated boron nitrite nanotubes. You know, say that quickly, uh, fast, but they're white carbon nanotubes, if you can think of them, and why they're hydrogenated. Hydrogen is actually a great protection from radiation, so it's pushing the material science, not just for space. As Aitan says, it's always a dual application. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if we really understand uh, the genetics of radiation and how that might affect our astronauts for cancer-causing mm -hmm. elements here? That's breakthrough. So that's how we look at, you know, it's for space that pushes us, don't say, it's really hard, Mars is really far away, you know, but why do it? Because we always have our eyes on what's the dual application, especially when it comes to the biomedical applications for here on Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, they're bold, big ambitions, but really the potential for Earth and people on Earth, and so radiation, I think, is the best example. It's tough, it's challenging, but if we think about it, um, you know, what benefit we could have here on Earth. Um, bone is, is the next example. Figure out radiation, then musculoskeletal. For bone, we're already using new pharmaceuticals. We've already understand at the, the cellular level more about, um, you know, osteoporosis. Of course, no one wants to get osteoporosis here, but if I put an astronaut up on space station for one month, I have the exact same condition or loss that you have in one decade here on Earth mm. from your 50, when you're 50 years old to your 60 years old. So it's the world's greatest laboratory because we've already looked at the biomarkers and the osteocytes, osteoblasts, and then, you know, the formation of those cells. So I think those are good examples of, you know, why space, why human spaceflight, because we're really looking at those type of, uh, you know, biological, but it's all about really, again, these prevention, protection for, for life here on Earth, for millions of people, not just a few astronauts. Mm -hmm. Again, we're all astronauts here, <laughs> orbiting our sun. Walking into <clears throat> building forests in uh, Johnson Space Center, you suddenly understand that there are thousands or millions of people around the world working to keep these seven astronauts in space. Maybe there are 11 now because the uh, AX3 was launched 10 hours ago. Mm -hmm. In Chinese, I don't know how many, how many are in space today, but a uh, few. And uh, there are thousands of people are working to keep them alive. Mm -hmm. You, you talk, from the ISS, you talk to Japan, Moscow, Europe, and the, and the US during the briefing and the debriefing every day. Mm -hmm. And one of the toughest things is there's no doctor on board. So a big issue is diagnostics and treatment. And the, a lot of the experiments are related to that. We took with us a helmet to, to check the brain waves and see if they change. We did a lot of testing before, during the mission, and after, and they didn't disclose the results of my tests yet, so I'm... <laughs> I can let you know. <laughs> Confidentially. We can get you. <laughs> so the physiology is a big, big uh, obstacle for long-term uh, human spaceflight. Each astronaut for a six-month mission, um, which is a, a standard mission on a space station, each astronaut does 250 experiments. And that, just to give you some, and if we have seven astronauts up there, so you can imagine, so that's just how much science we're doing, you know, on this amazing International Space Station. And just on that point, uh, our company does a lot of the commercial activity on, on the ISS, and the number one constraint, I would say, in getting experiments done is astronaut time. Um, and astronaut time is invaluable because of their expertise, but that is a constraint, for sure. So That's the, where uh, AI that, can come in too, right? <laughs> Be a little bit more efficient, or co-pilot with us. I would say that the NASA astronauts, uh, uh, the Russian and the European astronauts, national astronauts, most of their time they spend on maintaining the platform. And that was surprising to me. They spend a lot of time, the platform is not young. Uh, while we came up, and the AX3 guys, who it's a multinational for Swedish, Turkish, Italian, and American Spanish, uh, are now will board the, the ISS tomorrow, um, and they will not deal with maintenance. They will only do education, science, and what else? So it's a very big uh, difference when you send private astronauts with a full mission of outreach, education, and science 
uh, working side by side with the people who are maintaining the platform. Yeah, and that's to the point Bill and mentioned, we'll have to deorbit International Space Station by, by 2030. So, you know, in the coming years, for sure. And this is in all of our space stations. Uh, originally, um, you know, the U.S., we had our Skylab missions. They were, we were just trying to get longer duration, but they went up and they you need to come down. The Mir, as I mentioned, the Russian space station um, was 13 years in space, and it had to be deorbited. And for some of the same, the last year on Mir, I was an experimenter. I had my experiment up. But we were just we would just love it when we got science time because the majority by the end of life of a space station, the majority of the time was just maintenance, all of your you have to produce all of your oxygen, you know, make sure that the astronauts have oxygen. And so that's what as a space station ages, we've sent up some new systems, but we have to it's safety first. It's always safety first with human spaceflight and astronauts. So we have to make sure that there is a time when we can safely, you know, have to terminate and International Space Station. And the great thing is, by that time, we'll have these private space stations. The government's still going to invest, all the governments, but it's the public-private partnership. So the private companies and governments, and um, you know, so it's a, it's a wonderful future, I think, for space, low Earth orbit. The mention is only 400 kilometers up, so I encourage you to think of space not as um, even something special now. It's for everyone. Uh, you know, outreach, education, science, materials development, manufacturing, that I think oceans, land, air, and think of low Earth orbit space as being just part of our ecosystem for in our lifetime. Deep wow. space, yeah, <laughs> deep space to the moon and Mars, that's something else. <laughs> this is such an in interesting conversation. I think the, all the audience, we are all just listening very carefully. But I want to uh, open up for questions. I'm sure there must be a lot. Um, so, oh, there we have one in the back. I'm really thrilled to be here because I crossed paths with Deva, Deva, right? Um, in the late 80s at MIT, I was a postdoc and you were a graduate student. Mm. And everybody's eyes were on you. She did ex exceptional things throughout her career. Wonderful to see you. Um, I used to work as a space scientist for a brief while. And recently, I, I should have seen it when it came out, but I saw it more recently, a movie called The Martian. So my question to you is how far are we realistically, and you're not fiction writers, okay? How far are we from the technology that is made shown in, in the Martian. Thank you. Second. So um, thank you. Uh, so like I said, um, so we're, we're far along the way. We can't go to Mars tomorrow for a human mission. You know, we've been on Mars for 50 years with our rovers and robots. So we are on Mars, we're learning. But human spaceflight, again, is a different proposition. So I think we're only a decade away. Yeah, it's always a decade, but what do we need to do to get to Mars? We need to go to the moon first. Um, we have, we, first, we need a heavy lift launch. Um, so. Artemis missions now, the space launch system. We haven't had that since Saturn V. And now SpaceX is coming and Blue Origin. So we're gonna have three providers of heavy lifts. So that's the number one you know, issue we need for deep space, Moon and Mars. So check, we're getting there. So we have to keep our astronauts alive. Uh, we need new spacesuits. <laughs> um, you know, we have to, they're not going there to sit in the habitat, they're going there to work. So we really have to work on the life support systems, um, the, the spacesuits as well. And we, and then keeping them healthy and well, that gets to more of the radiation and the balance. But that's it, you know, so launch, we're getting um, close, the heavy lift launch capability, um, keeping them very healthy and safe. And then again, we um, are looking for life. When we go to Mars, we're looking for life or past life. So the moon missions coming soon. Um, I hope we only go, you know, spend a decade on the moon, getting, you know, really buying down those technology trades. So that's what, you know, a decade on the moon to, you know, there's no life on the moon, but looking at the technology. So those are really the technologies um, we need to think about. And don't forget about the human. We started this discussion with human well-being. We make, have to make sure that the team is working and functioning well together. So we're close. It's, uh, it's just, I think it's just will and vision and focus of purpose to do a global international uh, Mars mission. And then we, can, then we can do it. We can succeed for sure. Do we have another question? Yes? Hi. Um Great listening to you, especially as a um, scientist in training. <laughs> and I want to ask, um, how could international collaboration be increased? I mean, you, s had the, you said we are all in the same house, we are all on Spaceship Earth, but we do squabble sometimes. And on the ISS, not everyone's partaking, especially uh, what I'm thinking about right now is China and India. Both of them are developing space nations. 
but as far as I know, they're not participating. How could that be increased? And I would guess that them joining would help the international effort. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can take a stab at that. Um, I think the commercial sector has a lot to do with this as well. So one way we can collaborate is more standards. Um, if we had more standards around designing hardware in space, I'm thinking now space debris, uh, which we have a space debris issue, and the ability to deorbit satellites, repair satellites, grapple with satellites, I think that would make a big difference. Andreas and others at the forum uh, are providing leadership for the commercial sector on this, and we're having conversations on this. I think that can be helpful. With respect to the geopolitics, um, I think where we're headed, we're probably already there right now, are two different ecosystems. One would be a Western-led ecosystem exemplified by the ISS. Uh, that's growing. At the UN level, I believe there were 20 space agencies registered four or five years ago. Now that's 90. It's my understanding there's 90 space agencies. So a lot of countries have ambition um, and resources and uh, uh, wherewithal and capability, perhaps, uh, to, to go deeper into space. So you have the Western-led ecosystem, and then you have a Chinese-led ecosystem. Uh, think of it as sort of Apple and Android. Similar uh, operating dynamic, but different platforms. Uh, I think what uh, will play out over the next four or five years are these countries that have space ambition in the Gulf states, India, and others, which platform they're going to migrate to. Um, realistically, I don't think you can have your foot in both camps. I don't think it's practical from an economic standpoint. So I think that will play out over time. Uh, ideally, you would unify <laughs> Apple and Android down the road, and that would be, I think, everyone's dream. But realistically, I think we're going to have this dual platform for, uh, for a period of time. Thank you. I will add to that that <clears throat> on board the ISS, we were Russians, Americans, Europeans, Asian. Mm -hmm. And the cooperation was amazing. Each astronaut is expected to be independent in his work, but still needs the assistance of the others, especially on, on the first two, three days that you arrive there. The cooperation is amazing. The flying across borders on the ISS is free. Uh, on the American module, there's only one toilet. And when that breaks up, down, you <laughs> float at night uh, to the Russian section and uh, there's no, no issue about that. <laughs> cooperation, cooperation is amazing. Um, I'll tell you that I took along with me a 3D module of the World Peace Bell. It was donated by the, Russia, by the Japanese after the Second World War to the United Nations, and it's actually installed in the garden of the United Nations, and uh, the Secretary General rings it every 21st of September, which is the International Day of Peace. So I took a 3D module of the, of the International uh, Peace Bell and the World Peace Bell, and I left it on board. So every 21st of September, I hope the astronauts ring it. Mm -hmm. I hope so. And I want to just point out, um, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in soft diplomacy. Uh, there's nothing I'd like to see more than uh, unification and global peaceful uses of, of outer space. Dylan mentioned at the UN, that's what our committee is, uh, you know, peaceful uses of, of outer space. We can get this right. Um, um, historically, remember um, Apollo Soyuz? At the height of the Cold War, there was one handshake, one handshake in space mm -hmm. with a Soviet and an American astronaut. They became famous friends. Their families are the best friends in the world because we're all people. And I think we all love each other and want to work this out. So soft diplomacy. So I really hope that we can, you know, shake hands in peace. Standardization, if there's two platforms and private platforms and government platforms, um, that's what's coming. And if we, if we design to standardization, then guess what? I can dock to your station, we can dock here, and we can work out that we can all be living, hopefully, peaceful. But it's our choice. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of policy that would have to be, uh, and law, actually, that would have to be engaged to make that happen. But I mean, idealistic, and uh, we have a chance, and we have a chance to, to get this right. But culture and traditions are incredibly effective. And there's a tradition on the ISS that every Saturday night, there's a Saturday night movie. We eat together dinner, and there's a Saturday night movie. Now, who chooses it? So first Saturday night, the, the Americans chose a wonderful film called Princess Bride. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Probably no. So good. So good. Imagine 11 astronauts in a small space watching that laughing. <laughs> Second Saturday night, the Russians chose a movie called, I'm sure you haven't seen it, Salute 7. It's about a Russian space station falling apart. That's really surreal, you know, sitting there <laughs> on the station. Uh, I love it. <laughs> and you have dinners on Friday nights, yeah. community, Friday, yeah. community dinners. Everyone gets together for a community dinner because you're really, really, really busy up there. You're working, might not see each other all, all day, so it's very nice to come together again for a meal around the table. And you can't stay a long time in one space because then you use up the oxygen and it's not uh, enough ventilation. But if 11 of us uh, had dinner together, gathered around a very small one meter by one meter table, so it would be five, six straight up and five or six upside down, <laughs> eating the <laughs> same table. Um, uh, thank you very much for the discussion. We are, uh, just have two minutes left, so unfortunately no more time for questions, but I would love to hear an uh, inspiring message from, from you to the audience. Uh, very quick, but let's start with Deva. Okay, so a space for all. I mean, that's what I stand for, is global, international cooperation. Um, let's be the best that we can be and give all of our kids, uh, you know, that, that aspiration that we can, we can figure this out looking down on Earth. Um, we have to live together peacefully. I think we have to take care of the planet first and, first and foremost. So the hope that we can all come together, reflect, um, celebrate um, all of our similarities and that we're humanity and humanity wants to get this right, how we can live peacefully here on Earth. So I bring a, a message of openness and peace and for international um, global cooperation. Yeah, well said by Deva. I would just add to that, you know, space is the place, right? We're all space fans, that's why you're in the audience. So I'd like to deputize everybody to go out there and spread the word. You know, space is a tool for transformation. We go to space to benefit Earth. Space is the grand unifier. Uh, space is our future as a species, and um, it's a blank canvas, right? We can imagine humanity 2.0 on this uh, blank canvas, and as David said, it's up to us. Uh, it's up to the people in this room. So go out there, spread the message, and uh, space is the place. Don't forget. Agreed. We have to protect our atmosphere because from there you see how fragile it is, and uh, if we don't protect it, we'll turn into Mars. And then those who did reach Mars will have to find a way how to come here. And... Um, thank you so much. This has been such an inspiring panel. I wish we had all day, because honestly, it's so many more questions I would love to ask you. Um, but I think the overall message is that um, space, in space, collaboration always happens. Um, you know, even during the Cold War, like Deva was saying, uh, in space, there was collaboration, and there is so many possibilities, so many opportunities for breakthroughs in science and technology through space exploration. So please give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very, and thank you all very much. Thank you.